So we'll get started and I'm sure people will drift in from lunch. Um, but welcome to this, this is parallel session E, equity in agriculture, food systems, nutrition and health. So uh, you're, you're very welcome. Um, those of you who have seen the program might notice that I am not Joyce Kinabo. Joyce couldn't uh, make it today. Uh, she, her duties in Tanzania kept her in Tanzania. Um, so uh, you've got me. My name's Jodie Harris. Um, I'm from the World Vegetable Center and the Institute of Development Studies. So this session is really nice in that it builds on quite a lot of stuff that's been happening already in the conference. Um, obviously, it's building nicely on the intersectionality panel that we had a couple of days ago. It's also building on interest in equity uh, more generally, I'd say, in the agriculture, nutrition and health field. Um, so for instance, the high level panel of experts report on equity uh, and equality in food security and nutrition that's just out that I would urge everybody to take a look at if you're interested in the topics of, of this session. Um, so, you know, we know if we don't address equity, it holds us back on our goals and it's a, it's a justice issue. So it's an important topic and I'm really pleased that we have a, a session on it today. So we have six really great talks. We have three online and three in the room. And I'm going to structure today um, in sets of three. So the first three talks we're going to hear are broadly around issues of gender and intra-household allocation. And then we'll have Q&A for those three speakers. And then the second set uh, of three speakers are broadly around um, basic needs and access to services. And then we'll have another uh, Q&A session for those three speakers. So um, online, please do put your questions um, in the chat and we will um, come to those in the room. And if you're in the room, please um, hold those questions for the, uh, the two Q&A sessions. So great, so we're gonna start um, online. We've got Priya Bagawalia, who's gonna talk about gender, labor allocation, and nutrition in agricultural households. So over to you, Priya. Um, good afternoon, and um, thank you for having me online. I wish I could be there in person, but uh, couldn't make it. Um, the work that I will be presenting today is in its preliminary stages. Um, it's on the intersection of uh, fertility, gender, labor allocation, and nutrition. And since this is preliminary work, I will welcome all comments and suggestions for including aspects that I may not have taken into account. Um, so one of the things about agricultural households is that women are both caregivers and farmers. And uh, this has um, this assumes great importance, especially in developing countries where labor markets might be missing or imperfect, even though we tend to assume that um, uh, family and hired labor are substitutes. That's not really the case. And uh, women are often involved in very important agricultural activities such as soil preparation, harvesting, etc. They're usually primary caregivers for children. So one of the things that I wanted to look at in this study was how does the birth of a child affect the allocation of household responsibilities? And would it affect agricultural work? Would it affect child rearing? And would that have an impact on nutrition? Uh, there has been a tremendous amount of research, tremendous volume of research focusing on women in agriculture. There are studies that look at uh, differentials in productivity on men and women's plots, uh, in access to credit, agricultural investments. Um, there's a very interesting study by Nancy Chian that looks at the impact of price policies on survival rates of girls and educational enrollment. Um, there are also some studies in sub-Saharan Africa that look at how fertility behavior changes labor allocation. Um, so the main concept behind the study was that there is an income and substitution effect related to women's work. The income effect comes from the fact that as a producer or as a um, farm laborer, she adds to the overall agricultural productivity and income of the household. As a caregiver, there is a substitution effect because if she's devoting more time on the field, she's devoting less time to the children. So there is also an indirect impact, which is that as perhaps a decision maker on the field or on the farm, or with greater control of agricultural resources, uh, the woman might enjoy greater bargaining power and she might be able to invest in childcare at home. Um, the substitution effect does 
raise a lot of other important questions as to what happens to her own health, how much time does she really have uh, to care for children. There are studies which find that women tend to work less after the birth of a boy, and then there are studies that don't find a very clear impact. So this is what I wanted to explore in my work and see whether the birth of a son affects a woman's time allocation differently from the birth of a daughter. Um, we look at whether there's basically a twofold objective here. We're looking at whether the effect of having a son changes labor allocation, whether it contributes to more of agricultural productivity or whether it contributes to more of child rearing. And second, whether the birth of a son has an impact on the bargaining power of women. For this reason, uh, for this purpose, I'm using the India Human Development Survey for 2004, 5, and 11, 12. The latest round of data has just been made available. At this point, this is the only panel data in India which looks at both health as well as agriculture as well as uh, socioeconomic variables. Uh, in terms of measuring son preference, I'm looking at an ideal combination of sons and daughters. There are lots of questions in the survey that are on gender relations, um, the preferred sex of the next child, and I'm using the information on gender relations to construct an index of bargaining power, which uh, looks at things like who controls the financial resources, who has a say in decision making regarding her own health, as well as the child's health. Um, there is also some information, though not a lot. There is information on the number of days uh, or hours worked on a farm or taking care of livestock. And I'm dividing households into those with sons, with daughters, and with a combination of sons and daughters and comparing them. Uh, this is a preliminary study. Uh, there's a long way to go, but preliminary results throw up some interesting um, inferences. One is that there seems to be a very strong son preference in the data set. 26% of the women who already have sons say they still prefer the next child to be male. Um, having a son also seems to be correlated with having greater say in decision making, a greater bargaining power, and also if we sort of unravel that index, uh, greater control of financial resources. Um, most of the households that said they wanted a son also happen to own land. Now, even though um, the laws in India do permit daughters to inherit land, it seems that the social norms or um, the cultural mindset is still a little bit resistant to change and people would prefer to pass on that land to a son. Um, more time was devoted to farm activities and households with only boys and women who had more daughters as compared to sons were not likely to be decision makers on the farm even if they worked on the farm uh, they did not enjoy a greater say or they were not in control of production decisions 31 percent of the agricultural households do want their next child to be a boy women in general want uh, spend 110 days a year and 540 hours more if they have a son uh, they spend this in agricultural work or caring for livestock as compared to those women who had only daughters. Um, some uh, regression results suggest that the height for age Z score is marginally better in households that have only sons as compared to uh, daughters. And um, the household dietary level, uh, dietary diversity did not really show much of a difference between the two households. I suspect that the um, improvement, the marginal improve marginally improved HAZ that we see in households with sons has more to do with somewhat of an income effect which is coming through increases in agricultural productivity and second through the bargaining power or the higher uh, status that a woman enjoys. Uh, some broad inferences that can be um, um, that can be made while um, in, in many developing countries, imperfections in labor market do imply that uh, women play an extremely important part in agriculture. The birth of a son seems to accord a higher status to the mother. And this, especially in societies where land titles, access to credit, uh, policies that affect cash crop production will favor male labor. Um, if we try and model this in a production function setup, and if the production function of a household incorporates both agricultural productivity and health and nutrition, then it's likely that the birth of a son is one of those events where a woman is going to enjoy greater power and is also going to be able to have a greater control of financial resources or a greater say in agricultural um, decisions. And I realize that this uh, study is very limited in its scope because I only have two rounds of data. I'm hoping to be able to exploit the next round. 
but I think uh, as a starting point, it generates some very interesting um, uh, ideas in terms of um, how should we really help women who are also caregivers, who are farmers, who may not enjoy a greater say in decision making. And I think these results would be applicable to many countries in Asia as well as Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, thank you. I'll be open to any questions and comments. Fantastic. Thank you, Priya. So, yeah, showing how even the gender of the next generation affects the roles and, and agency of women. Um, that's incredibly interesting. I think we're going to move straight on to the next presentation. And for all the questions that I'm sure you have on Priya's presentation, we'll take them at the end of the first three presentations. Thank you. So. We're going to move on now to Fiona Coleman, uh, and Fiona's going to be talking about within household impacts of a nutrition-sensitive agriculture program in Bangladesh. Um, so as you just mentioned, my name is Fiona Coleman, and I'm a PhD candidate in nutrition at Cornell University. And today I'll be sharing with you some of my work from one of my dissertation papers titled The Within Household Impacts of a Nutrition and Gender-Sensitive Agricultural Development Program Implemented in Rural Bangladesh. So over the past few decades, Bangladesh has experienced really impressive improvements in agricultural production. However, it has been strongly focused on staple grain production, and this has led to diets that are rice dominated and nutritionally poor and persistently high rates of malnutrition. And so nutrition sensitive agriculture that encourages smallholder farmers to diversify their food products has been touted as a priority strategy for reducing malnutrition in the country. And this has been substantiated by strong evidence in Bangladesh that has shown strong linkages between agricultural diversification and diet quality, nutritional knowledge, and women's empowerment. However, most evaluations of nutrition-sensitive agriculture programs have been conducted only at the household level or for specific household members. And therefore, there's ambiguity surrounding which household members were meaningfully affected by the program. For example, if a household expands their food basket as a result of participating in the agricultural program, who is actually eating these gains? And this is a pretty significant gap given the concern that women and children are disfavored in household resource allocation in Bangladesh. And so the objective of the study is to examine the within household dietary impacts of an agriculture program that incorporated gender and nutrition sensitive messaging. And the setting in which we do this is the ANGEL program, which stands for Agriculture, Nutrition and Gender Linkages Project. And this study was designed as a randomized control trial, which was clustered at the agricultural block level. And it included 3,375 farm households across all regions of Bangladesh and we have food intake information available from all household members, which is relatively rare in the evaluation of an agriculture program. And then the study had four treatment arms. The first treatment arm was nutrition behavior change alone, and this had 19 trainings that covered topics such as basic nutrition, maternal and child nutritional practices, and water and sanitation. Then there was the treatment arm that was just agricultural production training, and this had 17 trainings covering topics such as cultivation of diverse food crops, homestead gardening, fish cultivation, and animal husbandry. Then there was the combination of agriculture and nutrition, which was all of the nutrition trainings and all of the agriculture trainings. Then there was the combination of agriculture, nutrition, and eight sessions related to gender sensitization, which covered topics such as interfamily respect, appreciation, communication, and negotiation skills. And then of course there was a control arm that received no benefits. And I did an implementation fidelity analysis and found that across all treatment arms, participation and acceptance was very high for both men and women. And the overarching objective of ANGEL was to identify which combination of activities, whether it be agriculture, nutrition, and or gender, is the most effective at improving production diversity and quality of household diets. And so what I do is I look at the impact of the program on a series of diet quantity and diet quality outcomes for all household member types. In terms of diet quantity, I look at caloric intake. I also look at caloric adequacy ratios, which is the ratio of caloric intake over estimated energy requirements, which is based on someone's age, sex, pregnancy and lactation status, physical activity level, and who growth curves for children. 
as well as caloric shortfalls, which is the distance from the calorically adequate diet. And in terms of diet quality outcomes, I look at dietary diversity score using the 10 food group method, as well as the global diet quality score and the probability of inadequate dietary diversity. And the reason I use, I look at probability of inadequate dietary diversity and caloric shortfall is to really zoom in on the program's impact on nutritionally deficient household members. But for today's presentation, I'll just focus on caloric intake and dietary diversity score. Okay, as for the estimation strategy or how I test for the treatment impact. So I include all individuals over two years old who have dietary intake information available both at baseline and endline, which is equal to 11,811 individuals from close to 3,300 households. And then I estimate treatment effects at both the aggregate individual level and by household member types, which includes men, women, boys, and girls. And then I use an ANCOVA specification, which allows me to test for treatment versus control differences, adjusting for baseline differences between the groups. And then to account for between household variation, I include a series of baseline covariates and cluster the standard error at the block level. And I use ordinary least squares regression in order to test treatment impact on caloric intake and dietary diversity score. And then I use post-estimation walled chi-score tests in order to test for impact differences between each of the treatment types and between household members for each treatment type. Okay, onto the results. So the first results I'll show you are the impact on caloric intake. I'll first orient you to the graph. So on the left side here, you'll see um, nutrition alone, followed by agriculture alone, then agriculture and nutrition, then agriculture, nutrition, and gender. On the y-axis is the treatment impact on caloric intake in this case. Um, and then each of these lines represents a different group of people. So the black line is all individuals, then gray is men. Um, the blue line is women, and then green for boys and pink for girls, and then the dashed line is the null treatment effect. And so what I find is that the combination of agriculture, nutrition, and gender is the only treatment type that has a significant impact on caloric intake or on overall quantity of household diet or on the aggregate individual level diet, and the impact magnitude is about 100 calories. And then when I compare impact differences between each of the treatment types, I find that the combination of agriculture, nutrition, and gender performs significantly better than all of the other treatment types by about 70 to 114 calories. And then I go on to test for between member differences for each of the treatment types. And I actually don't find any significant differences between any of the household member types. In other words, the treatment had the same impact on everyone's caloric intake or overall quantity of diet. Okay, next for the results on dietary diversity score. So what I find is that any treatment type that, has, that incorporates nutrition has a significant impact on dietary diversity or number of food groups consumed. And the impact magnitude is about 0 0.1 to 0 0.3 additional food groups. But when I compare impact differences between each of the treatment types, I don't find any significant differences. In other words, all of the treatments, even agriculture alone, which had a null effect, wasn't significantly different than the other treatment arms. And then I go on to compare the between household member type differences for each treatment arm. And here I do find a few significant differences. For example, the treatment type that was only nutrition, the impact was greater for boys and girls than it was for a woman by about 0.2 food groups. And then for the combination of agriculture and nutrition, the impact was slightly bigger for men than for women by about 0.1 food groups. Okay, now I'll share with you some main findings from these results as well as, as, well as the results I didn't get to today and implications for nutrition sensitive agriculture programs, at least in the Bangladeshi context. So first of all, nutrition behavior change communication communication is essential as agriculture alone may not be sufficient to improve diets. In fact, agriculture alone could be detrimental to some people as nutritional needs, but not nutritional intake may increase with participation in an agricultural program. Secondly, gender sensitization activities may improve caloric intake, but it may not have discernible effects on diet quality. And this doesn't mean that gender sensitization activities aren't intrinsically important. It just means that they're not really showing up on any aggregate diet quality measure. 
Also, generally, if a treatment was beneficial at the aggregate individual level, it was beneficial for all household member types. And the reverse was also true. If the treatment had a null effect at the aggregate individual level, it was not beneficial for everyone, for anyone. In other words, we're not really worried that a treatment didn't have an effect because just say men were hogging all of the food. Um, we also found no evidence of inequitable allocation of program benefits. While there were some impact differences between different household member types, the magnitude of these differences were quite marginal, and I can't say that they're biologically meaningful. And sometimes these impact differences were in favor of children. And so the takeaway message from this so far is that incorporating a well-implemented nutritional component into agriculture programs has the potential to modestly improve diets of all household members. Thank you. Fantastic. Literally one second to go on my timer. Wow. <laughs> Good timing. That was great. So yeah, gender sensitization helpful for some outcomes and, and not others. I'd be interested in any reflections on why when we get to the, the Q&A. So let's go uh, straight to our final um, speaker on, in this uh, gender sub section. Uh, so we have Miriam Beretta and she's going to be speaking on rapid evidence assessments on women's empowerment interventions within the food system. Okay, thank you. So hello everybody and sorry for not being there today. I, I couldn't make it. I'm now going to present um, rapid evidence assessment and meta-analysis of women's empowerment intervention in the food system. The team was composed of four of us. Uh, one of who, who is Charlotte Lane, who is at the conference in present these days and she also uh, presented another work, so please connect with her if you want to know more about this project. So what is a rapid evidence assessment? Very quickly, um, we call it uh, a rapid evidence assessment as it's not reviewed with uh, had some shortcuts um, compared to the normal assessment review. So for example, in this project, uh, we didn't run a new search, uh, but we have um, use studies that were identified in an evidence gap map um, that we do at RE. The scope is more limited compared to system of reviews. We look at fewer intervention and outcomes. Um, we did additional quality search, but the uh, assessment instruction was done only by one researcher. The analysis is more limited. We didn't run subgroup analysis and the protocol and report are also shorter. And finally, we didn't have an advisory group engagement. Although we, we still think that the results of this, important, this work are really important, so we're now going to present them. So the focus of this study um, was to look at the effects of women's empowerment intervention within the food system, system on the availability, accessibility, and affordability of healthy diets and nutritional status. Whether uh, there were some intended un un consequences, and we also want to know whether the, the effects varied by um, context and, and different uh, situation, other moderators. And we look at a, a total of 10 studies. So we, what we found is that um, in general, uh, women's power interventions have positive and significant effects on nutrition outcomes. In particular, on food security, for example, we found that the women who received intervention had a 59.5% chance of uh, um, having food security scores above the mean in the control group. Uh, the same was true for food, food affordability and availability, um, and also for diet quality and adequacy, although here the fact was slightly uh, lower, 53.6%, but still all significant. We also found positive and significant effect on the weight relative to eight, um, with uh, an effect of 54.8% in terms of chances of intervention um, to make the participant having an outcome above the control mean. Um, although we found not significant effect for well-being outcomes, and we couldn't run a meta-analysis on micronutrient status because there weren't sufficient data. In terms of evidence quality, um, most of the studies had some concerns, uh, and three, only three studies had a low risk of bias, and one had a high risk of bias. So the main bias were related to reporting bias, performing bias, and selection bias for the RCTs, 
while in terms of quality experimental design studies, the main issues were regarding reporting bias, pillover, crossover, contamination, performance bias, and funding. So the qualitative fundings also help us to uh, better understand the story. First of all, uh, these data are really important to understand better the context, um, because obviously in different contexts, men and women uh, often own different kinds of assets. Um, then we also learned that multi-component interventions can actually uh, be very um, effective in certain contexts, for example, parent training and, and access to agriculture access, may include access to paid work or agriculture components uh, for the farm work time for households, including women. Um, gender transformative approaches um, have been an important component in this study, and we found that, for example, gender norms uh, might be actually the first and really most important barrier to overcome uh, for success. Um, another, another finding is that including men and boys in inter interventions uh, can actually uh, help intervention to work better, and mobilizing women in saving and social groups might build conf confidence in the household and community. Finally, some of the facilitators that we have identified is that um, building men and community support may actually facilitate impact. Long-term interventions may shift social norms over time, and behavior change communication can actually encourage women's participation. Some of the barriers are related to the restricting social norms and religious norms can, that can, act, uh, can often um, in, result in men owning or sizing assets that are intended to be for women. And finally, care responsibilities can actually um, be a barrier for um, the success of intervention. The cost data, uh, when we're reported in the studies, we identified that um, usually the benefits outweigh the cost and that the multi-component programs are often more cost-effective than single component. So which are the implications of our results? Um, the implication for policymakers is that gender transformative approaches can be actually very valuable. Um, influence on men and boys and in, in target communities can actually shift social norms. Um, the content of culture and social adaptation to local context is really important to keep intersectionality in mind. And, the, and it's important also to focus on women's social capital. Um, finally, evaluating and implementing long-term interventions can bring to long-term results, and multi-component interventions can be more sustainable than single focus ones. Finally, the implication for researchers, uh, future studies should avoid, for example, to um, have outcome measurement bias, uh, reporting bias, spillover, crossover and contamination bias, performance bias, confounding selection bias. And one way to do it is to use um, experimental or quasi-experimental evaluation methodologies if we are going to look at the facts of the intervention. And also, we should ensure that uh, qualitative data is used and, when possible, and added to the, qualitative, uh, to the quantitative data to better understand the context and the stories behind the quantitative fundings. Um, we should make sure that the data collection is actually representative of the season and the context, especially in the, in the food and system and agriculture context, and that the interventions and periods are longer to be able to observe potential uh, long-term impacts. So thank you very much and looking forward to any questions. Fantastic. Thank you, Miriam. Wrapping up the, uh, the, the gender subsection, um, yeah, I think it's clear that uh, empowerment interventions are affected by uh, the context, the components, the approach. There's no one size fits all, and so we need some really careful research designs. I think we're going to move on to our second three uh, speakers now. So uh, a set of um, studies around basic needs and access to services broadly. Um, so we're going to start off with Anna. Anna Herforth uh, is going to be talking about nutrition as a basic need and a new method um, for, for looking at poverty lines. Thanks, thanks Jody, And uh, thanks, everyone, for being here, even in the 
the after lunch postprandial time of day. I appreciate your attention. Um, so I'm Anna Herforth. I, on your programs, Christy Mart is there. She is the lead author of this study, but she couldn't be here. So I'll be presenting it on behalf of Christy and our co-authors, Sherman Robinson, Channing Arndt, and Dara Kitty. And we are looking at the issue of how poverty is measured and whether that measurement really includes what people need to eat. And when we're looking at what it costs to eat a healthy diet that supports nutritional needs, um, this was the observation that we were faced with. So what we're looking at here, if you look at the dotted red line, uh, the, the highest one, this is the international uh, extreme poverty line of $2.15 a day. And the colored boxes there are showing the cost in international dollars of um, uh, the least cost of consuming a diet that would meet national food-based dietary guidelines. And the different boxes are the different guidelines of different individual countries. The blue box is a summary of those guidelines called the healthy diet basket, which has been the cost standard of looking at the cost of healthy diet now reported in the state of food security and nutrition in the world reports across countries. And so what we see here is that really by any definition that you choose of a healthy diet, the minimum cost to meet it is more than the total international poverty line, uh, let alone the portion of the poverty line that could credibly be reserved for food. Because of course, people have other needs as well besides food. And so our um, motivation of this paper is looking at uh, whether standard poverty metrics um, poorly reflect nutritional needs. And um, poverty is usually in most cases uses the, the cost of basic needs approach. And within that, uh, the food portion the food basket is constructed to satisfy a dietary energy standard and reflects consumption patterns of poor households. But we know that poor households generally consume poor diets, lots of starchy staples, insufficient nutrient dense foods. So this sort of creates a circular logic where the cost of basic nutritional needs is estimated from nutritionally inadequate diets. And how we think about what is the basic need for nutrition is really at the heart of how we think about poverty. So, um, you know, 40 years ago, when you think about the uh, 70s and 80s, um, there was a lot more frank energy deficiency in the world. Uh, the, there was really um, lack of calories was considered the major nutritional problem, and it really was a widespread problem uh, with about 30% of uh, energy deficiency in low and middle income countries. And so we could call this the food shortage paradigm of about you know, 40, 50 years ago. Now we have much more of a focus beyond just energy on healthy diets and micronutrients and a much lower you know, energy um, deficiency does remain a problem, but it's clearly not the only problem for nutrition. We clearly have major problems with micronutrient deficiencies and lack of consumption of healthy diets. And so in a um, in a World Bank paper uh, from about a decade ago, I called this the nutritious food shortage paradigm. So we've moved from a food shortage to a nutritious food shortage paradigm. And so we posit here that poverty measurement is still in the past paradigm of nutrition. And um, you know what, you can see this paradigm shift actually reflected in the food guides of Zambia. So here um, on the left side, we can see the food pyramid, the food guide from the 1980s. And it says here the big box is staples uh, with a little bit of relish that in the pictures you see green leafy vegetables, insects mainly. And then the top is snacks, which I think is fruits and nuts. Uh, the main advice here, eat more food more often. That has transitioned to the food-based dietary guidelines just released a couple years ago from Zambia, which clearly show a diverse um, plate or bowl full of many different kinds of food in proportions uh, that are high proportions of micronutrient rich foods uh, accompanying the starchy staples. So um, thinking about the nutrition standard for poverty lines, um, the current main traditionally used um, 
method for looking at food poverty lines is energy-based. Again, looking at uh, food consumption by relatively poor households, evaluated at median prices and scaled to meet a dietary energy target. So this is what is used in, in uh, a lot of countries. Um, we propose uh, an accompaniment or an alternative called the healthy diet food poverty line, which would be a new method incorporating more comprehensive healthy diet nutrition standard into food poverty line estimates. And we start, the basis for this is the cost of a healthy diet, providing the framework for this new standard. Um, this is a new global food security indicator that's now uh, reported by FAO alongside the prevalence of undernourishment, which, which reflects dietary energy, as well as people's reported food insecurity and the food insecurity experience scale. And the cost of healthy diet and the lack of affordability reflects um, economic access to nutritious food to meet dietary needs for an active and healthy life. So kind of what is the vision for food security? Um, and it is aligned with food-based dietary guidelines like those you saw in the Zambia new guidelines, uh, which are policy documents defined by countries uh, defining diets that meet nutritional needs. And um, the, the minimum cost of healthy diet, which we use for food security um, measurement, it does not incorporate consumption patterns that reflect uh, preferences of items. So it selects least cost items. Um, and so what we do here is we kind of marry the traditional approach to food poverty lines with the, the healthy diet basket standard. So in the traditional approach, the energy-based poverty line food basket, the nutrition standard is an energy threshold. Food selection is based on consumption patterns of poor or near poor households. Um, in contrast, in the cost of healthy diet um, method, the nutrition standard is food-based dietary guidelines, and the food selection is least cost foods. So putting these two together to think about healthy diet food poverty lines, we take um, the nutrition standard being dietary guidelines and the food selection based on consumption patterns of the poor. So what are the items that the, the food groups um, remain constant as a normative standard of a healthy diet, but the items reflect behavior as a um, descriptive um, selection. So now let's look at the composition um, of the energy-based food basket, the traditional approach as compared to the healthy diet food basket. And here we look at Myanmar as an example. It's not really to point out Myanmar as a specific case, it's really just an example This would be seen in many different countries. And so what we're looking at here is that uh, on the, the left side with the energy standard, we see the big green section is the proportion of the diet that's composed of starchy staples. And this again is reflecting consumption patterns of the poor. And we see a small amount in fruits, vegetables, dairy, um, meat and eggs. And when we look at the healthy diet basket standard, essentially it's the same items that are used, but the proportions are changed. So starchy staples goes way down, the micronutrient rich food groups um, take up a bigger portion of that pie to uh, reflect meeting dietary guidelines. And when we look at the nutritional uh, requirements that are met or not met from these two baskets, we can clearly see that the energy standard is severely deficient in most micronutrients, uh, whereas the healthy diet standard is, um, exceeds, meets or exceeds most micronutrients, except for one here, um, riboflavin, and this probably would show up a little bit differently. Again, we're not using a nutrient standard, we're using a food-based dietary guideline standard, and this is what shows up when you select um, the foods that are available to meet these proportions. So if we accept um, the healthy diet as a basic need for nutrition that we can see, it meets um, the micronutrient needs of people uh, much, much better than the energy standard, then what's the implication? Um, the cost of basic needs poverty line that's tied to an energy standard alone undercounts the share of the population able to meet their basic food and non-food needs. And so you can see uh, the comparison, the green looking at only the energy-based poverty line, the red uh, showing the percent, the poverty rate as it would, it would go up if um, it, the poverty line would reflect the um, cost of the healthy diet standard. So um, in conclusion, the uh, healthy diet poverty lines expand the concept of basic food needs to include both adequate calories and a balance of healthy and nutritious foods.
We argue the healthy diet is a basic need and should uh, replace the energy standard in counting basic needs for po poverty lines and that the healthy diet can be defined from dietary guidelines, which are national policy documents adjusted to reflect cultural food norms. The traditional approach of cost of basic needs and food poverty lines can be modified to incorporate uh, dietary energy targets and healthy diet food group targets. And again, poverty rates resulting from the traditional cost of uh, basic needs are likely to undercount the share of those unable to meet their actual nutritional basic needs. And so the standard cost of basic needs baskets are associated with significant deficiencies of micronutrients, whereas the healthy diet food baskets have no major deficiencies. And that is that the healthy diets meet uh, basic needs, whereas the traditional energy standard does not. And so using the traditional standard really sort of represents a double standard for, for food and the way that food is considered. There's an expectation that food uh, by consumed by poor people would be poor diets, whereas by everyone else, it would be healthy diets, and we want to have equity across what's considered a healthy diet for all. Thank you. Fantastic, yeah, reframing nutrition as, as a basic need that even the poorest should be able to, to, to access. Thank you. Um, so let's um, move on now uh, to Panima. Yeah, Panima Menon. Um, talking about comparing delivery channels to promote nutrition-sensitive agriculture. Thanks, Jody. Um, so firstly, um, thank you for the opportunity to be here. I'm representing work led primarily by Akhtar Ahmed and, and John Hodanot um, on this paper, uh, but Akhtar isn't available to be here, and I'm so, so I'm presenting it on their behalf. Um, so the question that we're asking uh, in this uh, analysis is whether the gender of the provider of agriculture, nutrition, and gender training in the context of behavior change programs makes a difference. And again, presenting evidence from Bangladesh. But I wanna start with a question to the audience. Uh, how many people here in the room are either designing, delivering, or evaluating nutrition behavior change or agriculture nutrition behavior change programs? small number. And in how many of your programs are the providers of the training male? Okay, so about 50%. Great. I think the, the presentation will be of interest to you all. Um, so the, the work that we're presenting today is also from the ANGEL trial. Um, I, I promise we don't sneakily submit uh, abstracts, renaming the trial differently just to, to get a space. Um, this is a pure coincidence that Fiona and I happen to be here together. Uh, but the background for the work was that in 2011-12, IFPRI undertook um, a survey called the Bangladesh Integrated Household Survey, which was really looking at um, a range of different things related to agriculture, nutrition, gender, participation in markets, um, and was one of the first trials, if you will, of the Women's Empowerment and Agriculture Index, uh, which was being designed at that point. The analysis that our research teams did with that, and I wasn't involved in that analysis per se, really shows, showed that firstly, agricultural diversity was positively associated with household and child dietary diversity. It showed that women's empowerment uh, was also associated with household, child, and maternal dietary diversity. And it separately showed that agricultural diversity was positively associated with women's empowerment in agriculture. Uh, and the ANGEL trial, which was really building on you know, these different insights coming out of this um, base analysis of the data, was that you know, it, would, it was useful for us to contemplate uh, undertaking research that really spoke to the nexus of these three things instead of looking at them in separate uh, combinations. And so we developed a, a concept note for the Ministry of Agriculture in 2014, so after this series of work, to uh, undertake a, a trial of programming to strengthen agriculture, nutrition, and gender linkages. In October 2015, the government approved the ANGEL project to be implemented as a, as a randomized controlled trial, and the project was then launched in, in October 2015. It was implemented by uh, the government agencies with the evaluation being done as a randomized controlled trial by IFPRI. So it was also quite an interesting innovation in 
uh, bringing prior research results to the government and then co-designing an RCT with them that they then implemented the programs around. Uh, so as Fiona mentioned, we evaluated the impacts of ANGEL using a cluster randomized trial with five treatment arms. Um, the ones of most interest to us in this analysis that I'll present to you today are the difference between what we call T1N, so named a little bit differently from how Fiona presented it, uh, which was a nutrition BCC alone. And, and here the training was conducted by mostly male government agricultural extension officers called sub-assistant agricultural officers, officers who are very much part of the agricultural extension services. Um, we weren't very sure about their, the ability of these male uh, agricultural workers to deliver a high quality nutrition, behavior change intervention that also included gender components. And so we, we included a second arm in the trial where the same BCC, this is now just the nutrition BCC, was done by local community women called Angel Pushtikormis, which is nutrition workers. And the term of Pushtikormi was quite prominent then in Bangladesh um, through some other nutrition work that was going on. Uh, and then the other arms are the ones that um, um, uh, Fiona mentioned. And so we'll, we'll really be comparing T1N to T2N in the analyses that I present to you today. Um, so, uh, again, just a little bit more uh, on the implementation of the, um, of the interventions. It was implemented in a wide variety of locations, but they were all agroecologically suitable for diversification. Uh, each of the treatment arms was implemented in 25 localities with 25 farming households, so we had quite a substantial number of clusters. Uh, the men and women were actually trained together, so this is not the providers now, but the agricultural households. The men and women were trained together, and small incentives were provided to the trainees as well, and, and the, uh, the evaluation itself was done using two rounds of household surveys, uh, panel surveys. Um, uh, as Fiona mentioned, the impact estimates were, impacts were estimated using ANCOVA regression models, and for this particular analysis, we included separate treatment coefficients for the uh, T1N, which is the agricultural officers, and the T2N, which was the Pushtikormi arm, so the male versus the female, and then conducted wall tests to assess whether the difference in impacts, um, whether there was a difference in impacts depending on who the provider of the, of the training was. Uh, so what we found overall uh, was that, uh, so here you, you need to keep your eyes primarily on, let me make this work here, Okay, on T1N and T2N, which are really just the first two bars there. So what you see here is that um, the bars in blue are where we saw statistically significant impact of the nutrition interventions on household dietary diet quality. Here, this is measured by WFP's food consumption score. Um, and although T2N was significantly better than the, than the control arm, we actually didn't find in the testing of the difference between T1N and T2N, there was no statistically significant difference there, suggesting that the gender of the trainer actually didn't uh, quite make a difference uh, in this situation. Uh, we also found with women's empowerment that all treatment arms significantly increased uh, women's empowerment, but here again, um, we didn't find a difference between T1N and T2N uh, in, in the models to test the effect of the gender of the, the provider. Um, overall, what we found in terms of the gender of the trainer and whether it made a difference was that despite what were really quite different um, backgrounds here, so it wasn't just that they were male and female, there were also a few additional differences between the two trainers because the agricultural officers were were part of the agricultural extension office uh, services, received a more robust monthly salary, whereas the, uh, the agricultural pushtikormis were locally hired women, received smaller uh, incentives and so on and so forth. But we didn't find a difference in the provision uh, in terms of the impacts of these two types of trainers. We found similar improvements, both in nutritional knowledge and good agricultural practices. I didn't present those uh, results. And it was interesting because the agricultural training wasn't quite part of the nutrition BCC, but you know, clearly people had absorbed the overall intent of the, of the program here. Uh, we found interestingly similar non-impacts on some of the measures of agricultural production diversity, um, except for eggs and dairy. Uh, and as I showed earlier, we found similar and relatively large uh, improvements in household diet quality. 
Now, what was interesting was that um, the gender of the trainer does affect attitudes. And so we found that men's attitudes towards um, gender equality improved more when they were trained by male agricultural officers than when they were, than, um, and, and women's improved more when they were trained by the female uh, Puchikormis, which was, you know, potentially related to sort of levels of comfort in terms of engaging with, you know, with these types of, uh, around these types of issues with people of the same gender versus being, being exposed to issues of gender equality by trainers uh, of a different gender. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, we had an intervention where we, we tried to deliver the intervention both by male extension workers and by female nutrition workers. The intervention itself engaged both men and women together. Um, and overall, the intervention was associated with increased production of some non-rice crops, higher farm, farmer revenues, improved dietary quality. Uh, and those are just sort of the overall um, uh, impacts. Um, we feel through the intervention uh, delivery and all of the other research that went along with this, that taking a household approach to train families together was quite, quite key to success in the overall intervention. Uh, and because the overall intervention itself was implemented with a lot of fidelity, again, Fiona mentioned that as well, there was a lot of attention in the delivery of the intervention uh, to content, to quality. There were some incentives to the trainees um, which you know removed some of the demand side barriers, uh, and and really solid training of the of the folks delivering the interventions itself. So under those circumstances, you know we find that the gender of the trainer itself made a little difference. The reason we tested it is because people were genuinely concerned that the male extension workers would not be able to effectively deliver the nutrition training, and so you know in terms of the implications for this. Um, the feature of some of these programs is that around the world, agricultural extension workers tend to be males and community health workers tend to be females. And you know, our study we think offers some uh, direction to the idea that you know, if you pay attention to other aspects of the quality of training, you can successfully overcome what are often perceived gender related barriers in the delivery of programs um, and, and use either type of delivery uh, mechanism if you pay enough attention to the quality of the intervention. Thanks. Fantastic. Really nice to actually test some of our assumptions about that stuff, right? About who can deliver things to whom. That's, thank you. Great. So we're going to move on to the um, last uh, speaker in the session, going back online to Shali Vishnoi. Uh, and Shali's going to talk about the association of dietary diversity with growth and micronutrient status in adolescence. So over to you, Shelly. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Shelly Ushnoi. I am from uh, ICMR, National Institute of Nutrition, currently pursuing PhD. Today, I'm here to give a presentation on association of dietary diversity with the growth and micronutrient status in 10 to 19-year-old adolescent in India. So this is basically secondary data analysis of uh, comprehensive national nutrition survey from India. The following slides contain introduction, objective, methodology, results, conclusion, and lastly, strength, limitation, and future research scope of this study. To start with the introduction, as we all know, adolescence is the age group which marks the bridge between childhood and adulthood. And among the huge population of India, to 53 million constitute the adolescent population. Proper nutrition during these years is vital for their growth and development, and along with it, proper nutrient intake of both macro and micronutrient is crucial. India is in the middle of nutrition transition, where underweight and overweight are two common public health problems, but irrespective of it, micronutrient deficiencies is at its peak. Since ages, diversity of food has been an important hallmark of a healthy diet, and a diverse diet, uh, diet is one which contains all the basic food groups necessary for achieving optimal growth and development. An increase in the diverse dietary diversity score of the individual can be linked to the nutrient adequacy of the individual. Keeping this in mind, the secondary data analysis of comprehensive national nutrition survey has been done to identify those gaps and to associate dietary diversity score with the growth and micronutrient deficiency. 
the broad objective of the study is to find the association of dds with stunting thinness and anemia as well as the micronutrient deficiencies of iron folate vitamin b12 and vitamin a the specific object is to assess the dds to analyze growth and micronutrient deficiency and to determine the association of dds with growth indicators and micronutrient deficiency the coming to research methodology the detailed methodology of the survey is available in the cnns report i have provided the link of the full report here i am going to discuss brief methodology for better understanding so the study design was a cross sectional one it was conducted in 30 states of india uh, uh, the sampling technique was a multi state survey design which was covering both rural and urban households the total sample size was around 35,000, out of which 18,000 were girls. Children were involved 10 to, 19, uh, 10 to 19 years of age, those who were usual resident of the selected household and those who are willing to give in consent. Exclusion criteria, uh, those uh, uh, individuals suffering from any disease condition were excluded from the study. Uh, the tools that were used in the original survey, so adolescents were categorized into two groups, so 10 to 14 and 15 to 19, and separate questionnaire were used. DDS uh, was uh, assessed by daily and seven consumption frequency questions. Adolescents were measured for the enthropometric indicators like height, length, weight, mid upper arm circumference, and weight circumference, etc. And biological samples like uh, fasting, blood glucose, urine, and stool samples were collected after enthropometric assessment. Material and method that has been used in the secondary research. Uh, this specific version of CNNS has been used for the analysis. To analyze the data, statistical software R version 4.2.2 was used for, uh, for that. Uh, descript descriptive analysis was done to arrive at the magnitude of prevalence. And exclusion of participants with inflammation indicated by CRP levels above 5. Uh, followed by the use of WHO recommended eight specific cutoffs uh, where wherever applicable to determine the association logistic regression was applied. Coming to results and discussion, the mean age of the subjects was 14. Adolescent girl constituted 48% and boys constituted 52% of the study population. Half of the adolescent belonged to urban population and another half to the rural population. The first objective was to assess uh, DDS among adolescents using the secondary data of comp comprehensive national nutrition survey. So 72% of adolescents have high uh, dietary diversity, which means they were consuming more than six food groups daily. Whereas 17% have medium dietary diversity and 11% have low dietary diversity. The mean DDS came out to be 6.8 to 6 and I have found no gender based difference in the dietary diversity of adolescents. The second objective was to analyze the growth and micronutrient deficiency. So the overall prevalence of anemia among adolescents came out to be 26.4%, followed by thinness 19% and overweight 8%. Uh, talking about the micronutrient status, 39% uh, have folate deficiencies. 25% were vitamin D deficient, followed by 21% those who have deficiencies of serum ferritin and 11% have vitamin A deficiency. The prevalence of anemia uh, in the age group, in boys of age group 10 to 11 was 12%, whereas girls of age group has higher prevalence of 15%. Same trend was uh, seen in uh, among 12 to 14 year old adolescent. Girls have higher prevalence of anemia than boys of same group. Other papers have also reported anemia prevalence using CNNS data. They found that 28.5% of adolescents were anemic with variation by region or state. The last objective was to determine the association of DDS with growth indicators and micronutrient deficiencies. And uh, the logistic regression has been adjusted for state, area, uh, gender, age, wealth index, and mother's education. And adjusted logistic regression revealed a significant decrease of stunting by 1%, reduced risk of vitamin B12 by 3%, and anemia by 4%. For every one unit increase in the DDS score, a uh, significant positive association was noticed for folate vitamin D deficiencies and non-significant positive association was noticed for thinness, serum ferritin and vitamin A deficiencies. Uh, 
uh, talking about the conclusion the dds association with growth and micronutrient status highlighted the potential of higher dietary diversity to improve growth and micronutrient status among adolescents in india and thereby reducing the risk of stunting anemia and vitamin b12 de deficiency Uh, lastly the strength of the study that it includes a large sample representative at state and national level covering a wide range of 10 to 19 year old adolescent the, and this research will provide leads on the potential of higher dds with the growth and micronutrient deficiencies among adolescents the limitation was that the dietary diversity data was a qualitative data hence it fails to provide insights about the composition and quantities of the food group consumed and being a cross sectional data causal relationship cannot be established the future research scope of the study that it opens up the area for further investigation for the quantity and composition of dietary diversity and we also need to know the other unmeasured factor that may have an influence on the micronutrient status in adolescents these are my references looking at adolescents and often um, neglected group uh, of, of youth between the children and the adults that we always always look at so great um we've come to the end of the second set of speakers so fantastic okay it's been really great to see um such a range of studies on on so many different aspects of inequality and inequity i think it's great that we're getting more and more equity focused work we're showcasing more and more of it in conferences like this um and certainly a, a call to all of us to uh consider whatever aspects of equity are appropriate for for your research for our research um going forward and let let's have have more of this so i think this has been been great um thank you all for being here and um maybe one last uh thank you to all of our speakers thank you